Hello and welcome to a new video featuring my new laser computer, a 386 desktop from Laser Computers from 1991. Laser Computers. Let's have a little chat about this Laser Computers brand. I kind of got fascinated by the history of the brand as I was researching for this video. Now, Laser is, or was, a very popular brand in the Netherlands, and myself being from Belgium, a country just south of the Netherlands, and also being a kid from the 90s, I knew Laser from these types of commercials. Commercials featuring this beautiful girl named Katja Schuurman. Now, Katja was, and still is, a very popular, beautiful singer-actress in the Netherlands, a real head-turner, and especially in the late 90s, I'm talking Pamela Anderson levels here. So for obvious reasons, Laser turned to her to have a very prominent role in their ad campaigns. It even went as far as Laser commissioning the creation of a pop song to promote their computer brand. In it, she sings about this old guy who couldn't keep up anymore and how she had her own desires and wishes for something new. She talks about how he became old and slow and how she wanted something new, how she dreamt about something more modern and a lot faster. An epic storyline for this laser computer brand and something that every guy in the Netherlands of a certain age will no doubt remember. The mere idea of creating a pop song like this filled with all kinds of sexual innuendo promoting a new computer is pure marketing genius and in my humble opinion accounts for a lot of the success of the laser computer brand in Holland. Don't forget that Laser had close to 10% market share in the desktop computer market, which is huge considering that big brands like Compaq and Dell were also very much active with much greater marketing budgets. But unfortunately that success would be very short-lived. The parent company VTech already deciding to exit the computer business in 1997 based on fierce pricing wars, Laser Computer Europe finally went out of business in 2002 and despite resuming their activities in Holland under the Laser Netherlands name, that also went out of business a year later. But to fully understand the history of the Laser brand, we need to go back to the parent company VTech. The global supplier of electronic learning products from infancy to preschool. The company that makes this. And this. And this. VTech, or Video Technology Limited as it was called back in the day, was founded in 1976 in Hong Kong by Alan Wong and Stephen Lung. In the beginning, they primarily made video games and electronics that were sold under different brands. But in 1980 came their first electronic learning product, the Lesson One, a tool to teach children basic spelling and math. In 1981, they created the Create a Vision, a hybrid computer featuring an integrated PC and a video game console. But it wasn't until 1983 when they first entered the home computer market and became an actual presence in the PC world. Starting with the Laser 100 series, based on a Z80 compatible processor designed in-house, similar to the TRS-80 Coco. In 1985, VTech started launching their first Apple II compatible computers, including this Laser 3000, a 6502 microprocessor running at 2 MHz with 64 KB of RAM, compatible with Apple II software. That was followed by the Laser 128, a semi-portable design with a 65CO2 microprocessor running at 3.6 MHz, doubling the RAM to 128 kilobyte, and with an integrated disk drive. The unit was also half cheaper than the Apple II, making it a real bargain. Using the same popular case design from that era, they also introduced the Laser Compact XT, an IBM-compatible XT running an Intel 8088 processor with 640 kilobytes of RAM, followed by fully-fledged IBM PC XT compatible machines like the Laser XT and the Laser Turbo XT. Now, during that time at the end of the 80s, a European subsidiary was founded, Laser Computers Europe, where a whole slew of 286, 386 desktop laptops computers were sold over Europe. 
So fast forward to 1991. So we've all been there, right? A busy day at the office, meeting with clients, number crunching, discussing getting home after a long days of work. Your team still at the office, finishing up. You checking up on them despite the kids begging for attention. But then a sigh of relief, your great lineup of personal computers saved the day and we were able to finish the project, all thanks to Laser. Laser Personal Computer, the logica van succes. Taking us back to my beautiful 386 desktop PC from Laser Computers. I obtained this computer from a trade from one of my subscribers and I have to say I'm really happy with it. This is a complete set, so it's a complete laser desktop monitor, PC, keyboard and mouse, although it's not the exact time period match, but I'm not complaining. This is a laser keyboard. These are very difficult to find. There's a little bit of yellowing going on also on the mouse, but we'll tackle that in a later stage. Because I want to focus now on the PC, which is the Laser 386-3. A very simple desktop model, no nonsense, just a three and a half inch disk drive, a reset button, three LEDs, and that's basically it. There is room for expansion in the form of a three and a half inch drive bay and two five and a quarter inch drive bays. We also have a matching VGA monitor from Laser. And as you can see on the screen here, we already have a reference to VTech computers. These are also not that easy to uh, come by, so really happy I got this in one complete set. The little hinge here seems to work, although it does need a little bit of a cleaning, but here we can control the vertical and horizontal shift and the brightness and contrast. Moving to the front of the PC, we have the laser logo and the model, which is the 386 3. We have a power LED, turbo LED, and a hard drive LED plus a reset button. Notice that we don't have a turbo button despite the presence of the turbo LED. We have the three and a half inch disk drive and room for another three and a half inch device and two five and a quarter inch drive bays. On the back of the PC, we have the usual suspects. We have a rocker switch here for the power supply, power input, power output. We have the power supply fan. This appears to be some kind of game port. We have the VGA card here, a AT style keyboard connector, parallel port, 25 pin serial port and nine pin serial port. And there also seems to be a sound card installed. So now let's turn on the machine and see what she does. We get the Tang Labs VGA BIOS. We got the 386 BIOS from AMI. For VTech computers, we have a four megabyte memory count. And then we are greeted with the CMOS battery state low error message. But we can hit F1 to enter the CMOS setup. And that's something we'll do right now. We'll specify the correct floppy drive, which is a 720 kilobyte drive. And we'll specify the correct hard drive. I have already peeked a little bit inside and I know that this is a 522 megabyte hard drive. And unfortunately we are greeted again with the same CMOS error. And if we hit F1 and decide not to go into the CMOS setup but exit for boot, then we get the drive not ready error. Now I was able to boot into MS-DOS version 5.0 of which I have 720 kilobyte installation disks, but it wasn't able to detect the hard drive at all. So we got an invalid drive specification for C and also FDisk couldn't find any fixed disks in the computer. Now I noticed when I rebooted that I again got the CMOS error and when I went into the setup all of the things that I had set up were gone. So yeah, most likely an issue with the internal battery of the machine prevents the computer from booting correctly. So we'll need to open it up and see what's inside. Now to open her up we need to remove three screws at the back and then the case kind of slides outwards and then we can pop it right on out. Let's see what this machine has to offer in terms of hardware. 
Now, I've always liked these little desktop PCs, and it's always a joy to see the Intel 386 CPU just sitting there in all of its glory. We also have a rather cheap sound card in here, but I mean, I'm not complaining. It's a 16 bit ISA sound card, but I'm really excited about this video card because, as you already saw when the machine was booting up, this is a Tseng Labs video card. So really excited about that and let's take a look at the hardware in more detail. Starting with this Intel 386 DX33 MHz from 1987. The PC features a riser card which has three ISA slots on both sides. There is a sound card on one side from analog devices. We'll need to see if we can get drivers for that. We also have some CD-ROM connectors I see. Here we have the video card, which is pretty interesting, the Tseng Labs. And here we have the two five and a quarter inch drive bays and the two three and a half inch drive bays, all packaged together in this neat little desktop. Now I wanted to take a closer look at the hard drive and I noticed some different screws here that were attached to the chassis. There was this Phillips screw here, but then there was this slotted screw here with this metal plate. Now this doesn't seem to be the standard way of hooking up a hard drive, as obviously some kind of rail mechanism should be used here. Because also on the other side there was this screw mounted here which was very difficult to reach and the entire solution didn't seem all that stable. Now using the tiniest screwdriver I could find, I was able to remove the screw from this bay, but obviously this drive bay mechanism was intended to be used with some kind of rail system and you didn't need to insert any screws here because there's just not any space here to insert screws. But with the final screw removed, I was able to get the hard drive out. So let's just remove the IDE cable and then the power cable. And notice how these brackets are used to hold the hard drive in place in this uh, drive bay. So this is definitely not an ideal solution. But this is a Connor 500 megabyte uh, hard drive. It's probably going to be the maximum value hard drive that can be installed in the system. So the geometry is printed out here. And that's what I used in the BIO settings earlier. So I'm anxious to see if this hard drive will still work and if we can get the machine to boot. Now to get the floppy drive out of the case, we had a similar issue. We had screws here, which were very difficult to reach and probably not intended to be used like this. But after some maneuvering inside of the case, I was able to get the screw out and remove the floppy drive from the case. Now the sound card bracket wasn't really aligned properly. It was as if, uh, it didn't really fit into this case because the the lid of the bracket needed to be pulled all the way to the front in order to get the screw in. So let's remove the sound card from the ISA slot here and take a closer look. So this is an analog devices chip, the AD1848 chip. Uh, lots of cards uh, used this uh, chip. This is a CMI8323 card I believe and beneath it we have the dreaded Dallas RTC battery chip here which is probably the cause of the startup issues that we saw. Now as with most of these desktop PCs, these branded PCs, they have integrated uh, I.O. capabilities like we have the hard drive cable attached to the main board directly, we have the floppy drive attached to it. We also have integrated serial ports and parallel ports that come out of the back of the PC. So lots of stuff is integrated into these custom main boards that were specifically tailor made for these types of cases. Okay, so time to remove the video card, which again has a very awkward positioning of the screw. And after a bit of offline camera fiddling with the screw, I was able to get it out and release the video card from the ISA slot provided by the riser card on the PC. And here we have it, the Tseng Labs ET4000AX, a really good video card for this type of computer, vastly superior over everything that was on the market at that time. 
Now with all of that VGA goodness, we would be tempted to forget the fact that there's this dreaded Dallas battery chip on this mainboard. So in order to remove the main board, we first need to get the riser card out, which is easily done. So here we can see there are three 16-bit ISA slots on each side. And to remove the main board, we just need to unscrew a couple of screws here. And we also need to unhook the LEDs and the power button cable from the main board, which is this single ribbon cable here. I already detached the PC speaker because my wife isn't particularly fond of PC speaker sounds late at night. And I also removed the reset switch here. And with that out of the way, all that's left for us to do is to slide the main board on out of the case. In order to get to the power supply, we need to remove this piece of plastic here on the back of the case, which will give us access to the screws of the power supply. And I will also be removing the front panel as it could do with a bit of a cleaning. So now with the computer reduced to its bare minimum, we can focus on the Dallas RTC chip, which is the one here. Now I have a drop-in replacement for this chip as you can still buy these Dallas RTC chips brand new from most electronic suppliers. So there's no need to buy new old stock or to fix the existing one. So I'm just going to be removing the old Dallas RTC chip from this main board and luckily it is seated in a socket so there's no soldering required. And as you can see they are completely pin compatible. It is a different type, it has a different number but they are completely compatible so we're just going to be swapping them. And with that done we can add our floppy drive. Now on the main board we have both the floppy and the hard drive ID controller present so it's just a matter of hooking up the ribbon cables and we should be good to go. So let's fire her up and see if we have an improvement on the Dallas situation. So we hear the hard drive spinning. We have a memory count. And we shouldn't see the CMOS battery low state now, but we should get a different error. And this is the CMOS system options not set warning. So this can be easily remedied by going into the uh, CMOS settings, entering the correct floppy drive and hard drive, and doing a reboot. And as you can see, it has finally detected our hard drive and it's booting from the hard drive without any issues. Apparently the system had a Sound Blaster Pro installed looking at the drivers, but unfortunately somebody was smart enough to remove that. And it boots right into this direct access menu where we see lots of games that are installed on the hard drive. So that's all we have time for in part one. Please join me in part two where we will go over all of the hardware in this computer, set up the sound card, look at the cool accessories that I got with this computer, and put it back together so that we can enjoy some games. So I hope you've enjoyed part one, and if you did, please consider liking, subscribing, and I hope to see you guys in part two. Bye-bye.